Hi, it's Rui now recording. So this is the lecture series. And the goal of these talks is to just give you a little bit of a sense of what we might be exploring before we go full speed into the summer. We only have nine weeks. And the hope is that this way we can hit the ground running. It's always a challenge of how much background to give, both before this program starts as well as once the program begins. In some years, we've actually spent a tremendous amount of time working on understanding all of the background theory so that we can do all the calculations. Other times we've basically been willing to just, you know, assume certain results and move forward with them. And so before I go into great detail in discussing what was in the slides, and I can always, you know, punch them up because I've put the links over here. Let me just talk a little bit about an example. I might have said this before. So one of my favorite results is the eigenvalue trace lemma. And this says, you know, the trace of A is the sum uh, A I I, I goes from one to N. And it's also the sum I equals one to N of the eigenvalues of A. The proof is not that bad. You know, the proof is trivial if A is what kind of matrix? Diagonal. Isn't it? Diagonal. Yeah. So it's also trivial if A is upper or lower triangular. And then you show any matrix can be triangularized. So given A, given A, there exists, let's say, S inverse, which is a function of A, such that S inverse AS is triangular, the eigenvalues of S inverse AS are the same as the eigenvalues of A and the trace of S inverse AS is the same as the trace of AS. S inverse, it's not bad because I have an S inverse, which is the same as the trace of A. This is essentially the proof. But we don't actually need to know this proof to actually use this in practice. And so all we really need is this you know, connection between sums of the diagonal elements and sums of the eigenvalues. So while I can give the proof, if we actually just care about implementing this and using this to do random matrix theory, we never need to use this proof at all. And so there are analogs of this for L functions. And you know, this is discussed in some detail in some of these talks over here. And again, the more you understand, typically the better it's going to be. You know, the more sense things will be, the, the greater comprehension you'll have. But there are a lot of results where we only need them to set up the calculation that we're going to do. And once we have the setup, how we got there doesn't matter. And so we can break it up into independent calculations. Okay, so for the rest of the time, I thought I would just turn it over to, I'm happy to go through the slides at warp speed. If people had specific questions, happy to answer those. You know, let me know what works for you. Let's start with yes. Uh, like when you were talking about um, the Riemann zeta function, I think there was another function in there which I didn't recognize. Was it the gamma function? Uh, not the gamma function. Uh, was it the, the C function? Yeah, I think it was the C function. Okay. So C versus zeta. And so one of the big questions we always have is what object do we want to study? So zeta of s is very nice to study. It's the sum n goes from one to infinity, one over n to the s, at least if the real part of s is greater than one. And it's also the product over primes, one minus one over p to the s inverse. And so we have to be careful. This function initially only converges if the real part of s is greater than one. And so we can talk about extending this to more values. And so let me quickly share screens. So here's the Riemann zeta function. 
and you know, as I just wrote, you know, it's defined initially as a sum over the integers. We understand the integers perfectly. So the hope is that by understanding the integers, we can pass from knowledge of the sum of one over n to the s to things about the primes. And later, we'll see that you can also write complex functions as products over their zeros. And so if you understand things about the distribution of the zeros, you understand things about the coefficients of the function, or vice versa. If I understand things about the coefficients of my series expansion, hopefully that gives me information about the zeros. So the functional equation is to look at what's called the completed zeta function. So we take the zeta function and we multiply by these nice factors, gamma of s halves pi to the minus s halves. And it turns out this has a really nice functional equation where its value at s is equal to its value at one minus s. So let me just talk a little bit about what this is because it's a really nice idea of trying to extend what we already know. So, Okay, so can somebody tell me what five choose two equals? Ten. I'm assuming you got that with the beautiful formula five factorial over two factorial, three factorial. Yes? Yeah, or like five times four over two. So four, yeah. Five times four over two. Well, if you're going to do five times four, I'm not going to let you say two. And two times one. Two times one. Okay, and so the one truly matters here. What is two choose five? Zero, probably. Zero. So we're interpreting this as how many ways are there to choose five objects from two? If you can find a way to do this, I would love to know. Now, what if we try to just use the old definition before as two factorial over five factorial, then it would be negative three factorial. Well, that's two, five factorial is 120 times negative three factorial. So negative three factorial, what should that equal? Infinity. Yeah, it, it, it has to be some type of infinity. And so this is a way to extend the factorial. And so in general, um, you would say gamma of s is equal to the integral from zero to infinity, e to the negative x, x to the s minus one dx, or it's sometimes written e to the minus x x to the s, dx over x. And it's nice to write it as dx over x because if you rescale x by five or seven or 13, dx over x doesn't change. And it has a lot of nice properties. Gamma of s plus one is s gamma of s. Gamma of n plus one is n factorial. If n greater than equal to zero is an integer. Uh, one of my favorites is gamma of one half is the square root of pi. And that actually occurs a lot in you know, probability in the normalization of the Gaussian. And so you know, why am I writing all of this? Uh, let me just quickly turn the paste from here. Okay. And so just you know, putting in the snapshot, you know, when we're looking at the gamma function, I'm so looking at the zeta function, when we multiply by stuff like this, this gamma of s halves is actually going to fix a bunch of things. So we just talked about a moment ago, you know, gamma of negative, I'm sorry, negative three factorial is basically an infinity. And, you know, gamma of n plus one is like n factorial. What the presence here of these gamma of s halves is going to do, whenever s is a negative even integer, we're going to get an infinity and that's going to cancel with one of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. So the Riemann zeta function, when we look at its continuation, trivially has zeros at the negative even integers. Is there any mystery in the distribution of the negative even integers? No. No, we, we, 
understand the negative even integers completely. And so because we understand the negative even integers completely, there's really no point in worrying about what's happening there. And if you look at some of the formulas for uh, sums over zeros of the Riemann zeta function, we actually can just pull out explicitly the contribution from the negative even integers. And that's where you get like a log of one minus x squared or something like that. It's, a, it's been a while since I've looked at it. It's a very known computable quantity. So by putting this stuff in here and looking at the completed zeta function, it just gives us something that transforms a little bit nicer. It removes some of these trivial zeros. And when we start talking about what is going on, you know, here's zero, here's one, here's one half. And so this is the critical strip. And we often want to study, you know, what's going on, you know, in this region. And then the Riemann hypothesis is that, you know, the zeros will just lie on the critical line. Now, when you look at the zeta function, if you do have a zero, you know, off the critical line over here, you'll have it the same distance over here. And then if you go up this amount, you also have it down over here as well. So one zero off the critical line would actually give you three others as well. If all the zeros have real part one half, if you can write the zeros as one half plus i gamma, where gamma is real, then there's a nice interpretation of the zeros. You can almost view these as energy levels of heavy nuclei or something like that. And you can start talking about spacings between events. We can't talk about spacings between the events zeros are moving all over the place. Does this answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I have two um, questions like related to this. So okay. the first question is like, the functional equation tells you not much at one half, like you, because you can't mirror. Correct. Right. And so, one half you basically get you know, C of one half equals C of one half. Yeah, and so, so or like on the critical line, so you don't get much information there. The other question is, so we have this Euler product only when the real part of S is greater than one. Yeah. So how do we extract information about the primes from values of zeta which aren't in, in that region? So how do we get information about zeta in other places? Uh, rather, um, we want to, so like, I kind of understand we can do some complex analysis to get the values of zeta or places, use some complex number theory or whatever. But how do we extract information about the primes from those values of zeta? Sure. Okay, so let me share a few slides. It's like if we know zeta one half plus i is something, how does that tell us information about the primes? Kind of like how we were talking about how zeta of two. Primes. So let me try to go through these slides and I'll supplement them as needed. So we start off with the logarithmic derivative of zeta. And you know, we could take the derivative of zeta as a sum or as a product. Since we're taking the logarithm, it's much better to use the product formula. And then the log of a product is the sum of the logs. And then the derivative is actually fairly nice. You know, this just comes in the denominator. What's the derivative of one minus p to the minus s? Well, you know, p to the minus s is the same as e to the negative s log p. So we get a log p, p to the minus s. Okay. And when you then expand this out using the geometric series, we now get a sum over, you know, primes of log p over p to the s plus something that's easy to deal with. And now if I hit this with a function x to the s over s and do a contra integral, I can use complex analysis to understand this side. And that's going to have contributions from the zeros and the poles of the Riemann zeta function. On the right hand side, when I do the integral of the good part against x to the s over s, it's going to be very easy to understand. It's not going to really contribute a main term. And then I turn out I have a really nice integral. And you know, for this integral, it doesn't matter is a prime number. It just matters I'm integrating x over p to the s power. 
And that integral turns out to be one if p is less than x, zero if p is greater than x, and one half if p equals x. So this integral on the right hand side essentially counts how many primes we have up to x. And then what we have on the left hand side is a contra integral. So I'm going to just take a quick screenshot of this. I'm going to stop the share, go back to PowerPoint, and just ditch this in here. I feel almost compelled to apologize for not using Vima, but for something like this, it is much faster to use uh, something like this and just you know, paste things in. So let's look at this integral over here. So you know, here is zero, one half, here's one, you know, here's two. So I start off maybe at the real part of s equals two, and I integrate from minus t to t. Or if you want two minus i t to two plus i t. And then I complete the contour. And so what I'll do is I'll add something like this. And then the hope is that the integral over the top, the far left and the bottom basically contributes nothing in the limit as t goes to infinity. So I have some location over here, maybe this is all the way down at minus r, and you want to look at the limit as t and r go to infinity. The hope is the integral over 1, 2, and 3 goes to 0, where this is 1, 2, and 3. And now, when we look at this from our results in complex analysis, all that matters is what's going on. Whoops. I feel the critical point in the wrong, critical line in the wrong spot. All that should matter is what's going on along the line, real part of s equals one half. So if all the zeros lie over here, the only contributions I get to will come from those zeros. If, however, I had some zeros off the critical line, you know, they'll have to occur with some kind of symmetry, then those would contribute as well. So what is the contribution that I would get? Well, when I look at this integral, so you know, again, I want to understand this integral, I need to figure out what is the contribution from a zero, you know, rho equals one half plus i gamma. Well, we know, you know, zeta prime of s over zeta of s is basically going to be like, you know, n over s minus rho if, you know, zero or a pole of order n. And this is just from writing, you know, say zeta of s as, you know, a n s minus rho to the n plus dot dot dot, zeta prime of s would be n a n s minus rho to the n minus one plus dot dot dot. So when you look at zeta prime of s over zeta of s, it's basically going to look like n over s minus rho plus holomorphic. So when I'm trying to figure out the contribution, it's going to contribute x to the rho over rho. So if Rh is true, then the absolute value is basically of size x to the one half over the absolute value of rho. And that's going to give us you know, some error terms in the contribution. Now this is coming from the zeros. There's also a pole, and the pole is going to give us an x to the one over one. And that pole is going to give us a negative contribution. Its n is going to be negative. So the negative and the negative will become a positive. 
Whereas down here, the zeros is actually going to be contributing a negative over here. And so what this tells us is that the sum of p less than or equal to x of log p is basically x plus you know, an error term. And that error term is going to be related to sums, if the Riemann hypothesis is true, of things of size x to the 1 half. If the Riemann hypothesis is false, then you know, if we go back to where we were, if we start having contributions from zeros in these spots, then we're going to have a larger error term than x to the 1 half. And so the more information we know about the distribution of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function, the more we can then say about this sum over here. And since this sum is equal to you know, this integral, 1 if p is less than x, 0 if p is greater than x, that leads us to being able to give us that the sum of the primes less than good x of log p is basically x plus an error. And the more we know about the Riemann hypothesis, the more we can say about the error. And now the question is, if we know the sum p less than equal to x of log p is basically x, what is the sum p less than equal to x of 1? So we basically want to just remove these log weights. So this is a common problem or theme in analytic number theory that it is much better to study related quantities. Now, log p doesn't really change that much as we vary you know, the primes. It's not going to be a huge change. So the question is, how well can we study this? And we can do some trivial estimations. So let's, let's just talk a little bit about these, because this is a good thought process. Let's let pi of x be the number of primes p less than or equal to x. Can anybody give me a trivial upper bound for pi of x? X. x. Right? So whenever you're doing number theory, your first impulse should always be, what is the stupidest, trivial, easiest result I can get? And if that's good enough to win the day, wonderful, celebrate. If it's not, then you have to think a little bit more. So let's start off with this and see what we can do with this. So let's study instead. Um, I will do P for prime powers of X is going to be the number of p to the k less than or equal to x, p prime k is an integer. So the question is, how different is it to study the number of primes versus the number of prime powers? And prime number theorem is that you know pi of x is approximately x over log x, or a little bit better, integral from 2 to x of dt over log t. So we have not proven that yet, but we'll, we'll prove it later. But let's just say we know that. How bad do you think it is to include the prime powers? It's not that bad, because um, you'll just have an extra constant multiplied by uh, x over log x. Probably not that bad. Right, so if we want to count how many prime powers are there up to x, it's equal to the number of primes up to x plus what? Plus the number of primes up to what? Root x. Root x plus the number of prime cubes up to x, which would be pi of x to the one third, right? Does everyone agree that this will give me the number of prime powers? Because if, if my prime power is at most x, then that means you know p to the k is at most x. 
So the squares go up to x to the one half, the cubes up to x to the one third. What's the largest k we need to worry about? Something like one over x squared. So what do you think it is? Something one over x maybe? Yeah, so two to the k, if that equals x, then k would be the log base two of x. Right? So the most we have to go up to is the log base two of x. So the prime number of prime powers minus the number of primes is going less than equal to, I'll just do it this way, pi of x to the one half plus pi x to the one third times the log base two of x. And the reason I'm writing it this way is the error term from pi of x to the one halves is larger than the error from pi of x to the one third. And the number of terms I have on this side is basically the log of x base two. I don't want to multiply this term by the log of x base two, because that's going to make my error a little bit larger than I need to. I only have to go from this point onward. I can just estimate this one piece individually. And so this would be uh, less than equal to x to the one half plus x to the one third log base two of x. So this is, you know, essentially, if you know the double notation, some constant times x to the one half. And by being a little bit more clever like this, I get a slightly better estimate. So we see that it's not a big deal to throw away all the prime powers or to put all the prime powers in. So any, any questions on this kind of calculation? So the question is now we want to understand, study the sum p less than equal to x of one, given that the sum of p less than equal to x of log p is basically x. We could study the sum n less than equal to x of lambda of n. And here, lambda of n is equal to the log of p if n is a prime power and zero otherwise. And so you would just have to show that adding the contribution from the prime squares and all that stuff is negligible. It's not a big deal. It's handled very similar to this. So, you know, show the sum, you know, p less than equal to x of log p is basically the same as the sum of n less than equal to x of log So we constantly play this game. Out of curiosity, has anybody here taken measure theory? I did. Okay, so in measure theory, did you ever play this game of we first prove things for step functions then we prove things for sums of step functions, then we prove things for continuous functions and just build things up like that. Yes. Yeah, we had we had simple functions thrown in there, but it's essentially the same. Right. And so it's the same game here. It's you know, which thing do you want to study? You know, sometimes one quantity is more convenient than another. And if you look at what's going on, you know, when we have you know the Riemann zeta function. When we take its uh, logarithmic derivative, so I guess uh, let me go back to the slides. Let me just take a quick snapshot. So when we come over here and we look at what's going on for the Riemann zeta function, it turns out we get this beautiful log p that comes out. And we want to now have a slight bias among the primes. We don't want all the primes to have the same weight. 
we want to weight prime p by log p. So these are very slowly varying weights, but they make the analysis simpler. They allow us to use complex analysis a little bit more cleanly. At the end of the day, however, we often want to remove the weights. So now, you know, the goal is to pass from, you know, the sum of p plus d equal to x of log p or the sum of n plus d equal to x of lambda of n to just the sum p less than equal to x of 1. So I'll let you try to you know, do this as an exercise. So in your homework, try to do this. One thing that's worth remarking is you're know, just getting a sense of the various sizes of things. So if I look at p less than equal to x over log squared of x, and then x over log squared of x plus equal to p plus equal to x. Can anybody bound the number of primes here? So how many, can you give me a bound for how many primes there are in this region. Just do prime number theorem. Like. We don't know the prime number theorem. What else? It's always annoying when you don't know the prime number theorem. But can you give me a bound for how many primes there are up to x over log squared x? We want to show this is about x over log x. So we, we, we believe that the sum of the primes up to x, you know, summing one every single time we hit a prime, should be about x over log x. Can someone tell me how many primes are there? Give me an upper bound for the number of primes up to x over log squared of x. Would it be 1 over log x? I'm not uh -oh. Or rather, log x may not know. I just want to know how many primes there are. Does the stupid thing work? Well, tell me what the stupid thing is. X over log squared x? Yeah, we know this is x over log squared x. <laughs> and so if we want to try to figure out, you know, what is the contribution from this sum for these primes, it's going to be at most log x times that. So contributes, you know, x over log x to you know, the sum, you know, p less than equal to x of log of p. Now let's look in this range over here. Okay. What can you tell me about the log of p in this range? Well, we know it's at least log of x minus log log squared of x. So basically, the log of p is approximately the log of x. So when I look at the contribution of these primes to the sum, it contributes approximately log of x times pi of x minus pi of x over log squared of x. And since we know these sums are all about x, the contribution from the small part over here is going to give us something of size x over log x. That's much less than x. We can trivially bound pi of x over log squared of x by just x over log squared. Even when I multiply by log of x, it's going to be small. 
And so this gives uh, log x times pi of x is about x and is the prime number theorem. Where did we get that the sum of log p is roughly equal to x? So we got that by doing our complex analysis. Okay. So when we do our contro integral. Oh, is that just the term from the pole at one? S equals that's, one? That's, that's the term from the pole at one. And so when we look over here, that was this part over here. The pole at one gives us x to the one over one. And then the zeros are going to give us x to the row over row. How do we choose our contour? Because you want because you're using the residue formula, right? So you need to have the pull at one, but then none of the negative zeros, right? Because you don't want any of the trivial zeros, right? Well, okay, so I, so I should have the, the, the pull here and I should also have you know this, the, the, the trivial zeros over here. Uh, you're absolutely correct, I should have those. But we can actually figure out what these contributions are. It's like log one minus x squared or something, right? Or it's one exactly, minus. and so it, it's been a while, I forget exactly what it is, but it becomes extremely nice because you're now summing x to the negative 2n over 2n. So we should be able to do this without too much trouble. Uh, what about the negative zeros? Negative even integer zeros from zeta. Should be something like the sum of negative x to the 2n over 2n, right? n goes from 1 to infinity. And so this should be the same as negative 1 half, the sum n goes from 1 to infinity, x squared to the n over n. And this is just going to be 1 half the log of 1 minus x squared as the log of one minus u is negative sum n goes from one to infinity u to the n over n. And so we can actually explicitly write down the contribution from the negative even integer zeros. So they're, they're not gonna be a problem at all when we are looking at what's going on from integrating zeta prime over zeta. Okay, and why, I, I just didn't really understand why, like the x over p to the s over s, um, why the, that residue is equal to one if p is greater than x, because it that, seems that, like- that, that, That's just a, that's a calculation from complex analysis. Okay, but you're using the residue formula, there, right? Because you're yes. trying to pull at zero for that, yeah. right? And then, um, you have a pull at zero and then you want to calculate that residue. So that, that would just be X over P to the S as S goes to zero. But that just seems like one to me. I don't see why that would ever be zero. Right, so let me just insert some of those lines. We want to study the integral say real part of s equals two of x over p to the s ds over s. I believe that's the integral we need to do. Yep. And then it turns out, you know, depending on is x over p, you know, greater than one or less than one, you get a different answer. And that's going to affect what happens as you do your contour shift. So this okay. is are we using are we using the residue formula here, or are we just doing like straight contour integration? I don't know. So I mean, you can try to you know write it down directly, and you know, you can try to write this as you know cosines and sines. Yeah. But I think you want to use the residue theorem, and you again. Where are we going to have problems? We're going to have problems at s equals zero. And then depending on whether or not this is greater than one or less than one, this is, I, it's been a while, here's zero, here's one, you know, here's two. And you know, we start off integrating like this. And the question is, when you're doing your contours, do you want to complete your contour like this?
or I guess maybe that's right. Or do we want to complete the contour? I guess not going in the wrong direction, but going like this. You know, which way do we want to do things? And if we do it one way, we will include, you know, the residue. We'll include the pole at zero. And if we do it the other way, we won't. Isn't our contour fixed because on the left hand side we're doing like the first, the left hand side, the one which goes to the left around yes, zero. Yes, but, but we can add we can add three more pieces and complete the contour. Okay. So this is basically the name of the game is complete the contour. And since all those like small pieces vanish, we like don't really care, right? That, right. Although they may they, they may not be small pieces. Well, yeah, they, I guess they're big, but they vanish anyway. So correct. And that's the whole point is that when we add the other other parts, it's not going to really give any contribution to the limit. It's going to go to zero. And then we just have to do this contour two different ways. Depending on whether or not this is greater than one or less than one in absolute value, that's going to affect, I think, like convergence over here, over here. So for instance, if this is less than one in absolute value, we want to shift to the right. Because since it's less than one in absolute value, when um, S has a large real part, this is going to become very small, right? Yeah, OK, that, now that makes sense, yeah. And so if, what does it mean for this to be less than 1? So if x over p is less than 1, shift right as integral over, we'll call this r, is small and is less than one when p is greater than x. And that's why we're not going to get a contribution when p is greater than x, because when we shift like this, there's no contribution over this side and there's no pole inside. If, however, p is less than x, then this is greater than one. We don't want to shift to the right. We want to shift to the left. And then it's over this piece that's going to be small. And now we will have the contribution from the pole at zero. Okay, does that answer that question? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I just didn't realize that you yep. only really care about the real line and then you, I mean the, that line and then you just kind of add the complete contour thing and it works. Yeah. Yep, no, we, we are doing a tremendous amount of material very quickly. The goal you know, for today is basically explicit formulas. And this is where I started with the eigenvalue trace lemma. This is the you know, prototypical example of an explicit formula. It relates what we want to understand, the eigenvalues of A, to something that we can get our hands on, the matrix elements. And we can do similar things with the Riemann zeta function. And so when we have the explicit formulas, you know, it's going to be coming from you know, something like this. You know, doing a contra-integral of zeta prime over zeta. And when we write zeta as the log, we can get this as over here beautifully in terms of sums over the logs of primes. And on this side, we're going to get things involving zeros of the Riemann zeta function. OK, I think we have time for one more question, and I have to go to my next meeting. Um, I had another question about the GOE conjectures really quickly, um, like okay. the random stuff at the start of it. So um, in the the semicircle law, right, uh, like your um, probability measure was defined by like delta of x minus lambda i, you sum over all of them and right. do some weighting and stuff. Right, I don't know. Yep. So, so, so really the, the GOE conjecture, could you also, um, could you like interpret it as the probability measure and just like in a similar way and instead of delta x minus lambda i, use something like x minus lambda i plus one plus lambda i or something, just like almost a difference between. Right, right. And so this, this is for the density of states. Yeah. And this is gonna lead to, you know, the semicircle law. Right. 
And then you know, a harder question is the gaps or the spacings between eigenvalues. So if you just replace lambda i with lambda i plus one minus lambda i in that for first formula, does that kind of give you what you're trying to calculate? Right, so if we want to do adjacent ones, we would do like lambda i plus one of a minus lambda i of a over some normalization function, right? Yeah. And then we would look at something like this and then I think it would be like an n minus one. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Okay. And then and that, and that would be the quantity to study. And the big question is always what do we want to normalize by? So let's see. If we go back to something we looked at a little bit earlier, yeah, we, we did the calculation uh, fairly quickly. But let's see where was it? So over here. Do people roughly follow this as the proof of the prime number theorem that if we know that this sum is of size x, we get pi of x is of size x over log x? This was a really, really fast sketch of the proof of the prime number theorem. And the idea was we know the sum of log p up to x. So we want to just figure out the sum of one, not log p. We want to count how many primes, not how many weighted primes. And we said, well, if we count all the primes up to x over log squared of x, each one contributes at most log x. So the contribution from all of these is at most x over log x. That's much smaller than x. So the contribution to this sum from the primes up to here is negligible. Now, the primes that are left over, they all have their logarithm is about log of x. And so when I look at you know, what's going on, you know, even if I included, you know, this stuff over here, it's going to be much, much smaller. And, you know, the amount of primes that I've lost by only starting here is essentially nothing. So almost every prime up to x is at least of size x over log squared of x. So I'm hoping I impressed some of you a little bit. How many of you have ever done the three epsilon proof? No one ever did a three epsilon proof in analysis? We did a 53 epsilon proof. I'm sorry? We did a 53 epsilon proof. Okay. So you, the goal is you, you often break something up and you, typically in analysis, you want to show, you know, given a delta, I'm sorry, given an epsilon, I can find a delta so that a certain expression is at most epsilon. Sometimes we do what's called a three epsilon proof because we break things up into three pieces. And then when we sum them all together, it's at most three epsilon. If you wanted to do a little bit more work, could you get it to be less than epsilon? Of course. Replace epsilon by epsilon over three. Or sometimes when you do the calculation, you might get your know, three epsilon for one piece, your know, epsilon over four for another piece, and 15 epsilon for another one. It's still going to be less than some fixed constant times epsilon. So it's arbitrarily small, but if you wanted to, you could replace epsilon with epsilon over 100, and now it's strictly less than epsilon. Over here, I chose log squared of x. Did I have to do log squared of x? No. What could I have done instead of log squared of x? So the main thing was, you know, I have this like x over log x. I could replace this log squared of x with some function, say, g of x, and then just go through and see what is the smallest choice of g of x that I can take and have everything still work. So the smaller g I take, the more primes I'm going to get in this region here, the less primes I'm going to get here, but I'm going to now have less difference over here because the bigger g of x is over here, the bigger gap I have in terms of how log p varies. So there's competing influences. 
And so, you know, it's, it's a game to choose things so that I know my contribution is going to work. If I had chosen, you know, log of X over here, do you think that that would work or would that be too small? So what would have happened if this was log of X rather than log squared? Contributes at most X, which is kind of trivial. Right. So if, so if this was log of X, I would get X over log X. I multiply by log P, which I'm just approximating as log X. And then that will give a contribution of size X, which is the same size as the main term. So if I try writing this as X over log X, it's too trivial of a bound. And I would need to do more work. By choosing log squared of X, I'm safe. What if I did X to the one half? Well, then there would be very few primes in here, which is great. But then I would have X divided by X to the one half. That's of size, ew. that's of size, you know, square root of X. And now log P would be going from one half log X all the way up to log X. So there'd be a huge difference in size. So the larger I take my denominator here, the less contribution these pieces are going to have. Whoa, that's kind of cool. Uh, the less contribution those pieces are going to have. But then the power is going to be over here. And so in general, you often have two competing influences. So what you might want to do is you might want to say, well, let me do the error analysis here, see what the error term is. Let me do the error analysis here, see what the error term is, and then make my choice that gives me the lowest combined error and try to basically split the baby. All right, so uh, I think this is a good place to stop. I have to go and run to another